And now um, I want to bring in my MPF co-founder and good friend, Anna Chalenza. Um, Anna and I have had the, I've had, not Anna has, I've had the enormous privilege of working with Anna. Uh, in co- I've had the privilege too. A music industry course at Georgetown for the last five years. And, you know, for me personally, it's been, you know, such an, a, a, an important complement to the advocacy work that, uh, you know, we do here because, you know, when you have to get in front of a live audience of 25 really smart, really motivated people who care deeply about music and the future of the community, you know, you really have to be able to, to, to be intentional about how do you talk about things? How do you talk about issues? How do you, you know, does it land? Is it connecting? And then how does that fit into the context of their experiences as young people who have a fundamentally different relationship to music and to technology and to the consumer marketplace and all the, the sort of policy, you know, touch points that we talk about in history and the fact that the Tele- Telecommunications Act, you know, is older than most of our students and all these different things are, are, are such a, you know, a remarkable sort of check on, you know, the work that I do and others. And, and so today we, we are so happy to have this conversation because, you know, we talk constantly about building better structures, building a more resilient and equitable industry. Um, and, and, and that, in, in, in my mind, is inextricably linked with the generational handoff of, of, of power and authority and control. And so, Anna, I asked you to come in and help lead this conversation. Um, Gigi or Storm, would you mind introducing Armin and Clyde in terms of, you know, their, their kind of role in the community? And, and then we just kind of just get it going. I don't know. Sure. Uh, I, when I first decided to get into music business education, Clyde Ralston was a name given to me as someone I needed to meet very quickly. And that was a long time ago. And, and since then, Clyde has always impressed me with the way he's, he and, and Belmont have, have changed to meet the needs of students through the years. And Clyde's a, a, an awesome, awesome teacher and, and he's created new curriculum and is always on the leading edge of what's going on. And uh, uh, Armin actually uh, succeeded me as president of MIA and has just done amazing things with the organization, especially given last year when, when you know, he had to deal with a conference that was scheduled to be in person in Washington, D.C., uh, and, and not only has put together an awesome conference with his team, and, and they've created some awesome new programming uh, around MIA, and, and I, hopefully he'll mention that, but two great folks we've got here with us. Why don't we just start kind of big, big picture and, and Armin, maybe as since you're president of MIA, this would be a good one for you just to start with. I mean, for those in, in today's program that have not really been part of this particular niche, part of the sector, what is MIA and how do you sort of conceive of or, t- or think about what this kind of field is? Absolutely. Um, thank you so much for having me, Michael. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, MIA is the Music and Entertainment Industry Educators Association, and it was formed in uh, 1979, so about 41 years ago, uh, I believe from some folks at Belmont and some other schools that really wanted a way to connect as music industry education was slowly starting to take shape. Um, I think as a field overall, we're still kind of new uh, when you look at any other uh, you know, university majors out there. And so ever since then, we've had an annual summit that usually takes place uh, historically the week after South by Southwest because folks would come to uh, uh, Austin and then a lot of international academics as well. And then they would stay around that week and join me at wherever it would be held. Started out in Nashville. Now we rotate between Nashville, Nashville, L.A. and uh, Washington, D.C. because there's so much going on on the legal front. Um, And as Storr mentioned, we were due to have our in-person summit of over about 130 attendees about two days before DC shut down for COVID. So it was a bit of a scramble there. Um, But we've pivoted to online. Mia has an annual journal that it's had for over 40 years. Um, It's a resource for folks in the entertainment industries in academia. It's a way for a tenure track and other researchers to get their voices heard, to publish research. Um, The summit is really great. We really mix industry with academia. So we have folks presenting their research and then we bring in keynote speakers from all over the industry. Uh, We do annual legal updates, especially nowadays when there's so much going on. And so as Storm mentioned, we had to pivot to online like most other folks. And um, out of that became uh, a regular event called Mia Meets. We, We just had ours two hours ago. 
Um, and it's kind of a, every other week or once a month. And it's just on a you know, topic that's current and we ask folks to join us and we've actually had a lot of success with that. We have folks from Australia and Sweden uh, that joined us today as well. So um, it's truly an international organization and we're still uh, growing actually quite a bit in Latin America and Spain um, as well. So can I jump in with a quick question, yeah. Michael? Because um, thank, it, it's, first of all, I think it's incredible work. It's so important to have like a place where we can all come together. And I'm curious, you know, when you look at these conferences and meetings, it's a great place over the years to see how the industry is changing and how does education change. I was wondering if all of you could speak to changes you've seen in the last, say, two to three years. Things that, 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 you're, that you're presenting differently or interests that students have that seem to be a little bit new. Of course, with COVID, I'm assuming, too, there, there are changes to be made. I wonder, Clyde, do you want to jump in on that? Uh, yes, thank you. And, um, I, you know, as a senior statesman here, I guess, a long-term MIA uh, member, uh, I have seen a lot of change. And in the early days, it seemed like we had a lot of faculty from a few schools. And now we have a lot of faculty from a lot of schools um, and, and maybe the numbers of people attending from, you know, Belmont and University of Miami, MTSU might be a little smaller. But there's been a lot of growth, not only in the United States, but worldwide of music business programs. And so we're attracting, uh, you know, faculty and industry folks uh, from, you know, all over the world to uh, attend and, and participate in the, uh, in the conference. And I think that's been, you know, the, the major change um, is just the, the growth. And, and despite, you know, downturns in the industry, um, you know, the education portion of it has continued to grow pretty steadily. Yeah. I mean, I would say at Georgetown, I think Michael and I can both attest to this, um, just monitoring our students' uh, interests, what they listen to, has exploded. Like it used to be there were always like these same 10 people that would pop up on the first day survey. And now we get, you know, everybody has completely different artists that they're listening to. So there's a wide range in there. And then, you know, another thing I'm curious about uh, uh, with this is uh, I am noticing we're getting many more students from the business school who are wanting to be a part of the entertainment industry more so than performers that are taking the courses to like promote their career. And so I'm wondering if you all, maybe, you know, we're an outlier, but I'm just curious, what are you seeing with these topics in the last few years, what in students are interested in? Gigi? Um, I come from the business school side at UCLA <laughs> where I taught for, for 10 years. So I was teaching a mix of students and then came to the music school. And I do feel like in some ways the students are kind of catching up. But I do think that the students I was teaching 10 years ago, I was teaching an advanced music marketing class and we scramble like the Dickens to stay advanced as everything moves forward, is that it was many more artists who were trying to figure out how to be creative with their management and how not to get screwed over. That's kind of where our portfolio was. And now we just launched a new music history and industry program and had triple the number of creatives or of applicants that we thought we'd have, but uh, creatives who wanted to be a bit of everything, not going label side necessarily, but they wanted to understand how they could be a singer songwriter and have a career in management and go work for a, a small label and and have a real portfolio of options, not the, it's, you know, uh, it's Interscope or bust. It, it's a, and maybe that's because we have a history bent to it as well. So it's folks who really want to understand the, the space of it all, et cetera. So maybe that's also, we're getting that. Uh, but I am finding students who are, who are much more entrepreneurial and much more wanting to build something, not just have a job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's definitely the case. Armin, any? I didn't want. I didn't want to leave you out of the conversation there. Oh no, um, I, I, I actually the. I just now that I, I listened to Gigi, I'm actually the opposite of hers because my my degrees are in classical piano performance. So I come from the music side, and I'm at University of South Carolina now, and my department is uh, sport and entertainment management, and it's actually one of the top rated sport management programs in the world. We have tons of international students, and over seventy percent of our uh, student uh, body is from out of state. And I think my program at this point has over 1,200 majors and 800 minors. So I'm more of in a, in a management college. 
Uh, so none of my students, they all love music, but I don't have any musicians in my program. So I miss my musician friends um, a little bit. Uh, all of my coworkers and colleagues are in the business field. Um, but I'm really seeing these students being excited. I am seeing much more entrepreneurial ideas and um, just what the students want to study. And so it's exciting to see the music fans be here, essentially, and want to work in the industry. So it's a, it's a little different perspective on my end. So I want to yeah. build on something that we kind of referenced a minute before, and, and I would just love y'all's perspective on this. Um, the tension between being sort of an instructor and sort of saying, this is how things are, this is what you need to know. And again, this emerging generation that are like, what's the first time you heard about TikTok, right? I mean, like, you know, people who are sort of have an understanding of the future of the industry that might be different than my generation would be. And, and how do you navigate that as educators, you know, sort of feeling the need to, again, share your expertise and your knowledge, but also be open to that, the fact that our industry is changing so rapidly that they're in some ways going to be more expert than we are on certain elements of this stuff. Is that a tension that you see a lot in the field? I think you really have to recognize the, the student's involvement uh, in the industry. And I, you know, in my marketing class, one of the very first things I'll, I will tell them is I am not an expert in this field, you know, because it's just too broad and it's changing too fast. And there's not one way to do this right. So, you know, you're interning. At a, at a record label, share your experience because, you know, I may tell you how we did it at my record company or, you know, how somebody else is doing it, but you may be doing, you know, something completely different. So, uh, you know, tell me uh, your experience. And, you know, when it comes to the internet, I don't spend eight hours a day surfing for, you know, the, the latest, you know, music and that kind of thing. And so I, you know, I try to get them to, uh, participate and contribute because that way I'm learning, you know, hopefully as much as they are. Mm -hmm. I was going to say that I have 60 researchers a year going out and doing the research and bringing it back to class. And that's my design is that they're off, you know, I can tell them what happened last year. And then, uh, and then I send them off and then bring executives in. I mean, that's what's great about Zoom right now. Goodness gracious, I have a couple execs from around the world who come in and participate with my students each week. But I have students out deeply researching existing companies and talking with them online and teaching other students that way. That's my entire course design. They don't want to hear from me. Goodness gracious. They want to hear from each other and they want to hear from top execs who you know are, are excited to come to class. And of course, I'm sitting in Los Angeles. So I've got students who already have been playing out for years and they've been already interning and they bring all that with them. So that's the joy of it. And, and yes. I would add, I would add that, uh, you know, I, we, we keep the fundamentals in mind. I mean, social media has specific strategies that are going to work no matter what the platform is. And, and, and uh, as, as was mentioned, this thing changes so quickly. The joke in our the joke in our field is that any textbook that is made is is outdated the moment it goes to print. Oh. And um, and and so, you know, as long as we're keeping the soft skills in mind that they need to keep, uh, you know, focusing on as as they deal in their internships and in their courses. And as long as we're keeping in mind, you know, that it's TikTok now it might be Clubhouse a year from now whatever, we, it, we still have to understand the basic strategies and, and, and modes behind each of those deliveries. Well, and I mean, I'm going to jump in and say that I also think you all shouldn't sell yourselves completely short in that we have already experienced many decades of the music industry that they were not around for. And I think there is something to be said with not trying to reinvent the wheel every time. So to give a perspective of what's happened, what worked and what didn't. And also with the issues of like these systemic issues that cause that are really coming to the fore right now with systemic racism and gender issues and, um, you know, bringing people in from the industry and having them talk gives them a chance to say like this is what this is an issue that's come up that's not really working well and we should have seen it coming and I think mm -hmm. it's good for students to kind of you know talk be, be be ready to look for to critique their own world as opposed to just um yeah playing just saying everything's great and how do I get a job and how do I monetize this um so I mean I'm curious that's part what, of what yeah. uh I was excited 
Uh, I think I froze. I'm sorry. We can hear you. Okay, I'm I'll sorry, go. I totally froze. Go ahead, Annie. Go. No, I was going to say, I mean, I think that this is a responsibility of us too. And I think um, with the conferences that you all are doing, that was one of the things, Gigi, that was most exciting in, in Storm is to see that there was real representation and there wasn't that the industry is a bunch of, you know, no offense, but, you know, 50 year old white guys. I mean, it was, I have white guys, it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and there's, that's great, but there's more than that. So, but yeah. that was exciting. And for students to see that, just to see the face that pops up on the screen of someone who's working in the industry to, to make that connection. I think that's important. I don't know if you want to talk about how, how do you, how do you build that, you know, when you're thinking about guests and thinking about the conference, Gigi. I just want to, Maybe make two comments on that. One is that I, I'm a big BS detector personally. So for me, part of my goal in teaching is to get my students to take the the rose colored glasses off and see what's happening under the hood. And this past quarter, I had my students uh, nicely going after one of my guests about how in the world they hire diversely, and it was not something at all that the guests thought they would have to deal with. But you know, if you're trying to look at fit in a small entertainment company. What is that code for? And the students did a beautiful job of having that conversation. And I don't know if they would have been that comfortable doing it. Um, I, I, we, we're looking for more representation, more diversity of, of voices. And it is kind of a hard conversation to have. Um, I, the thing I was going to comment, which is a bit of a twist on that, is I can't get students to go to these events. And it, not just our students, but, you know, Digital Entertainment Week's going on this week. Uh, Storm and I are, uh, because of Amplify, speaking at, I don't know, 10, 15 events this past year, and I'm not seeing anyone's students there, or maybe I'll see five across the entire thing. So I would love to see our students actually going out and seeking things outside the norm, because it's all digital and essentially mostly free. And, um, you know, to me, I'd like them to go see more diverse things than what they see, both in terms of other people's voices, but even other areas of the business. And I don't know what you guys are all seeing as to, you know, I, part of it, there's a glut of stuff going on. But in this era, you can't wait for someone to tap you on the shoulder that, that there's so much going on where you could be immersed. And I think in part, we're still creating the boxes a little too tight. Mm -hmm. And students are wanting a tighter box. So somehow to blow this up more is one of my big goals. Yeah. Anyone else? Any, any insights into that? How do you all get your students outside the box? Uh, you know, one of the things, and I've been teaching at Belmont since 94, and one of my observations is that the, the recent crop of students doesn't have the same uh, initiative that they did when I started. And, you know, um, I don't know how we fix that, but I certainly would like to encourage students, you know, not to wait until you get your diploma to start getting into the business. And, um, yeah, it, I, I see this just in, in, in the way my advisees lean on me for information that's easily accessible. And, and the same thing is true in the industry. And, you know, you don't have to wait for us to cover it in class to go out and find all this stuff. And, you know, as Gigi said, there's tons of events going on that you can participate in. You know, just because you're a student doesn't mean that you're not welcome. Yeah. And I, I wonder how much of this, um, if COVID is also um, affecting this, because yes, it's easy to jump online to a Zoom event, but I know that like Michael and I always incorporate until COVID happened, um, we incorporated a conference, which was like at the university, bringing all these people in that was a core of the class and the students loved it. They came, they stayed, you know, all two days and they networked like crazy because they'd sit down and they start talking with someone. And I do think there is a, a level of shyness that, that has happened because of COVID like that they'll, they might even be on, but how do you connect with someone if you don't already know them? And I, I'm wondering if you all have had any like attempts at trying to overcome that. Like how do you network on, on uh, in zoom? Or have you done that with your classes? Yeah, I well, can just kind of, I, yeah. I was, I was just going to jump in and say, I know, I know with Zoom, especially since, you know, it's been over about a year now and, and some students, it's just hard and they're, they're just kind of zoomed out. We are back to campus uh, 
part of our courses and mine are both in person this semester. Um, but when I do have a Zoom guest speaker, I let them know that they have to look their best and they have to make sure their room is clean and they're all gonna have their camera on. And that's just a rule I have. And you know, there's a little bit of back and forth on that. Is it appropriate? Are we allowed to require that? But to me, you know, we're teaching management and I think you, you have to be presentable and I'm very big on that in my courses. And I always have my students reach out to the guest speaker either with a thank you note or if they're interested in internships. So I think there's a few different ways to engage them. Um, it's certainly harder if, if we allow them to leave the camera off and just tune in. Because then when the class is over and I say bye and 20 minutes later, there are still four students logged on. I know that they're out doing something else. They're not even in the class. So, so this is why I've, I, I've just kind of created some requirements around that. Yes, Storm, I thought you were going to jump in there. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, it, it, it's pretty obvious that, that Zoom has changed the way we have to teach uh, and, and the way we have to engage students. And I am a faculty fellow here at the University of Colorado at Denver and work with faculty throughout the university on this. And, and so it's not something, of course, just that we experience in the music business. It's, it's true everywhere. And, and um, Armin mentioned some strategies, but they're pretty, the students are pretty open uh, about their frustrations and, and wanting to, to meet the other people in class. And frankly, I, I would think we'd all say that that's one of the, the, the important things about our programs is that, you know, the students get to meet their possible, possibly the partner that they will start a business with, possibly their future boss, possibly their future employee. And that, that part is, very, it's very important for us to try to engage as much as we can, but it is, it is absolutely challenging. Uh, with Zoom and and there's there's a number of publications out there and, and tip sheets and things like that, but ultimately it comes down to yeah, the students. One one of them told me he was taking a shower during my lecture and, <laughs> and missed the quiz. And I, okay, all well, right. Um, so yeah. yeah, Gigi, you had you were going to say something. I was just going to say there's other places to go as well. So we're not the only fonts of wisdom. And I put in the chat that Music Biz has their next Gen U coming up. And they have been having regular sessions. And that's just one a couple days ago. There's just absolutely wonderful. And a lot of it is students want to hear from people closer to their age. I get that feedback all the time. I'll bring in, this is the CEO of blah, blah, blah company. And they go, that's nice. He's like 40. So, um, <laughs> you know, there's, there's opportunities to hear other voices. So uh, Music Biz has great programs. And then House of Blues Music Forward has launched their stuff again. And, and they're working with folks extensively. Um, you know, similar stuff that uh, Grammy in the classroom um, is having a bunch of programs. They had 8,000 people uh, participate in their last round of programs. Normally they had like 800. So uh, there is ways that people can be with their peers or a peer-based program and listen to younger voices of, of us. Of us old folks are not the interesting place to go, so. And if I can just reach out, there's something Michael and I did this last year, and I'll just throw it out there if you guys want to try it. Um, you all have, you know, lots of people that you've invited in the past, and I'm assuming a deep alumni groups. Um, I when, when we couldn't do the conference, I just reached out to Georgetown alumni that are working in the industry and said, I, my students aren't going to get a networking opportunity. If I hook you up with a student, would you have a half hour one-on-one -on -one Zoom call? And every single person did it. And all the students loved it. And they made that connection and they kind of left the class going, wow, I was really able to network. I didn't think I would do that on Zoom. So, I mean, it, just throwing it out there, Michael and I had a lot of success with that. Yeah. And that's a great way to get virtual internships also. that We kicked <laughs> off a lot of them pulling our alumni and past speakers in and said, hey, you're trapped at home. Would you like an intern to work with? And so that was also a great connective tool. So I want to broaden out and, you know, ask sort of a, a more difficult, you know, question about, you know, just higher education in general and the sustainability and affordability and the utility of higher education. I have two children in college, a third will be uh, starting next year in college. So we're living through it, you know, in my family. And, you know, again, you know, a lot of what we talk about in this program are big structural challenges. And certainly the entire model of, of higher ed um, is a challenge. And I, I just would love to get your, your take on, um, I mean, either just broadly, sort of what you would like to see happen or think we need to, you know, some of the challenges that we need to, to try to address around access and affordability and taking on student debt and all those issues. 
And related to that, if you have sort of internal sort of guiding sort of like metrics for success or what are the expectations that a student coming out of your program, what are you hoping they're able to, you know, sort of get into professionally? Like, how do you think about that sort of, you know, what does it mean for a person to come out of your program um, and feel like it was a really good investment of their time and money? So those are like 14 questions, but if there's anything in there anybody wants to take a shot at. Well, I'll take it. I'll, I'll take, I'll make two points in regard to that, Michael. And one is, you know, it, it's sort of ironic that we're, we're here talking about the music industry and there was a great article. I wish I could give, provide a link or a reference, but there was a great article that I read recently through the higher, uh, Chronicle of Higher Ed that compared actually what is happening in academia to what happened in a music business in the late 90s when there was disruption in the form of digital downloading and, and piracy and things like that and understanding how these disruptions that we're experiencing in, chronic, in, in education um, are, are very similar in ways that we have to change our model uh, to fit what uh, students are looking for. And then the second thing is just demographically speaking, uh, we are, I, you know, for anyone here, we may, may or may not know that uh, we're looking at a, a much smaller population of 18 to 19 year olds and high school graduates coming up as a result of, you know, back in the 2008 eight recession, people stopped having children. So we're about to hit, a, 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 we're, we're gonna get a double whammy here of the pandemic and that uh, much smaller population of, of high school graduates, which are, you know, a, a large part of the market for students. So. It's, it's interesting, the, the, um, the analogy to that. And so we are having to change the way we teach, uh, the, the programming is the way we take care. Of, you know, here at CU Denver, we have a first year student program uh, that, that really uh, focuses on new students and making sure that they get through that first year successfully because that's when we lose a lot of students. But we're, we're definitely having to, to, to change the way we're looking at things. Mm -hmm. Another thing. Another change in, in uh, education that probably impacts uh, a school like Belmont, a uh, you know, private institution where the, the tuition is relatively high, is the number of states that offer free or cheap uh, two years of community college. Uh, and, you know, the bargain shopping uh, parents have been into you know onto this for a while, but now it's it's really being institutionalized, um, and it's great for the students, you know, because you can save a lot of money by taking a lot of those gen ed courses someplace else before you transfer to you know a private school where the tuition costs are are you know probably maybe four or five times what you know state school uh, might be. So we're seeing a lot more. Uh, students coming in, transferring, and we've had to adjust our, our course offerings uh, to accommodate those students. So we now offer our first two music business classes as half semester courses. Hmm. You can take those two classes in one year, and if you've transferred in as a, a junior, uh, you're catching up really quickly. Hmm. Another thing that's changed a lot with COVID is international students were in some ways the fuel for a lot of what we're doing and that that dance is gone or it's shifted to other countries. So if you're able to do remote classes, then that's a whole nother beast. Uh, another thing is FAFSA applications year over year are for incoming freshmen are down again. So we thought this was a one year gap where there was a um, 22% decrease in community college entering students and a double digit decrease in public for uh, four year universities. This may be year two of that, not just bumping kids out a year. I, I was just going to close because I know we're, we're at the end of the time, but commenting about, you know, do you need a music industry degree, minor, or whatever to be in this industry? And I do think that there's no. And I do think that there's a uh, uh, a challenge, and I've had long talks with the House of Blues folks who are looking at this issue about the fact that why should you have to pay tuition to get a free internship? So you're, you're, you're essentially giving your time away as well as paying tuition, and that makes it for families who have lesser incomes or, or chronically lesser incomes. You're, you're in a game that is hard to win. So I do think that finding alternate pathways is something there's quite a few organizations that have been working on in communities 
that you know right now we've got this odd addiction to the free academic internship which makes the kids essentially pay twice and mm-hmm. if you've got kids putting themselves through school with with part-time jobs or or um it, it doesn't make sense and so i i can that's a long soapbox i'll get off of no. no, not at all. But I think I will say I also though think that we as faculty can go to our universities and say we should be able to let these these internships count without paying credit. I mean that that, that there are some schools that have done that, and I think you know that I think that's important that you do the internship or maybe even that there's funding that pay the students cost of living over the summer while they do their internships. And I think that's something that we as faculty can step forward and try to make that systemic change within our various colleges and universities. That's, um, yeah, no, I think that's such an important issue. I'm so glad you, you both flagged it. And, and as Gigi mentioned, we are um, at time and this conversation obviously could go a lot deeper and a lot longer. And so I apologize that we you know are gonna kind of have to Wrap at this point. I mean, a couple other related issues that all fit into the broader ecosystem. Again, we we talk a lot about what is going to happen with the Biden administration. Uh, we have a lot of confidence that the Department of Education is going to be reengaging around arts education at the K twelve level, which is hopefully going to you know really uh, have a lot more people coming out of high school with more sort of engagement and 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 sort of a tactile sense of the music industry or interest in that. We have the whole community youth development field, which we talk a lot about uh, on this program and organizations I know in Denver, Youth on Record is working hard on thinking about equity in the industry and sort of how to you know, reform uh, you know, from a COID kind of perspective. And again, that hopefully is filtering into um, this academic field as, as people are coming in with uh, a lot of new ideas. And, and hopefully as we talked about with Zach, you know, just a sense of, um, urgency and opportunity that we don't just have to be passive in the face of these structures, but that these students who are passionate about the industry feel agency and, and the ability to change the industry and to, you know, build, a, a, you know, kind of build different structures or better structures or, or, or a different, you know, sort of way of thinking about things. So um, thank you so much to all of our guests today. Thank you, uh, as always, to Alex Dolvin and thank you, Gigi, one more last time for connecting us with Alex, uh, doing a great job producing this. As I said before, if uh, you have any uh, interest in sharing this uh, session with friends or colleagues or want to look at any of our previous 32 programs or Music Policy Forum Intensive, all that stuff lives on our archive. If you have questions, concerns, comments, suggestions, and gently worded constructive criticism, you can always email us at musicpolicyforum at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from all of you. Have a great and safe weekend. Happy Mardi Gras, and we will see you next Friday. Thanks, everybody.